Welcome. My name is Ryan Satterwhite, and I serve as Director of the Office of Service Learning and Leadership at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and teaching faculty at Claremont Lincoln University. I'm pleased to serve as your moderator for this ILA Leadership Perspectives webinar. Today's webinar features Dan Jenkins, past chair of ILA's Leadership Education Community and co-founder and co-chair of the ILA Leadership Education Academy. Dan's remarkable scholarship focuses on the instructional and assessment strategies used to effectively teach leadership in higher education, both face-to-face -face and online. Dan has published over 40 articles and book chapters, several books, and facilitated or presented more than 60 workshops, conference presentations, and professional development seminars on leadership education. He has been teaching undergraduate and graduate level leadership courses online for the last 10 years. This webinar is structured to help those who are shifting to online leadership education to do so with confidence and resources at hand. Given his experience and research, I'm confident that we are all about to walk away with some great new resources and insight. Dan, thank you very much for your time, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan, for the introduction. So let's jump right in, everybody. So we're going to, our goals for this uh, webinar today we're going to start with why talk about well where do we begin when our classes have been uh, switched uh, rapidly online uh, meeting some leadership educators where they're at uh, we do a brief brief history of leadership education online talk a little bit about the differences between face-to-face -face and online leadership education and what we know about that as well as share uh, some information about instructional strategies and learning activities, some low-hanging fruit, and by that I mean what are some instructional and assessment strategies that are really easy to transition uh, from our face-to-face -to, -face to our online, as well as share some resources, and we'll share some resources throughout. Um, our goal is to get to Q&A at about 30 to 35 minutes through, um, so uh, we're going to uh, pile through this a little bit, um, but all for the best uh, so that we can get to um, this information and, and make sure that we can share as much content and resources with you as possible. Um, so starting with the why a little bit, um, you know, in, in 2009, I was working towards my PhD uh, about halfway through and embarked on a project to create a course in teaching leadership. Um, and so that experience was a springboard that really pushed me to make that the focus of my scholarship. And, and so I've been working um, and doing different types of uh, scholarship on that uh, since uh, since about the, the the turn of the last decade, and this is really my my passion and space for uh, for paying it forward and increasing the capacity of leadership educators to do their work. So starting with why, part of this comes from this idea of advancing a community of practice. We have a community of practice of leadership educators, and that is extremely important. Um, and so one of the resources that I'll come back to uh, over and over again is this great publication called The New Directions for Student Leadership, uh, which is edited by uh, Susan Kamavis and Kathy Guthrie. And there's, gosh, maybe been um, a couple dozen issues that have come out uh, over the last five years or so. And so a recent one that came out literally had a chapter um, that I co-authored with Lisa Enersby and Carrie Priest about uh, leadership education advancing a community of practice. And that's what we're doing right now. ILA reached out to Ryan and I, and uh, we are hoping to advance this community of practice by creating these resources for this uh, <laughs> predicament uh, that we have found ourselves in. Um, as well, you know, so the experience that Ryan uh, alluded to, so I've been teaching online, you know, for over the last decade or so, and I was teaching at University of South Florida before that. Um, at my institution at U University of Southern Maine, we have everything from a minor all the way up to a new PhD program that will start um, in the fall. Uh, minors, uh, masters, bachelor's degrees, um, as well as a, a new uh, graduate certificate in professional leadership education. And so that will be fully online. And so we're kind of meeting the demands of the field and making sure that there is some credentialing and some professional development uh, that is, you know, more formalized for leadership educators. So we're going to start with one of our poll questions so we can get a sense of, you know, uh, who's on the call, uh, who's on the webinar, and and you know, this idea of meeting people where they're at. So um, if we can get the, the poll question to come up, um, the question will be, you know, did you register for this webinar because you must move your face-to-face -face course online, um, that you have a bit of experience teaching leadership online, or you have some experience um, and are supporting colleagues new to online teaching? And so I will wait for um, that poll question to, to come up. And if you would just take maybe 30 seconds, I'll keep a, keep a counter here. I, 
attending today, you must move that course online, you've got a little bit of experience but need guidance, or you've got some experience and you're supporting some colleagues new to online teaching. All right, about 10 more seconds. All right. Brian, what are our results? I'm not able to see them on my screen here. There we go. Perfect. Now I see them. Wow. Okay. So more than half, 51%. You, you're here because you must move your face-to-face -face course online. 29% have a bit of experience teaching online but need some guidance. And 21% have some experience in supporting new uh, colleagues new to online teaching. That's awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. That gives me a sense of exactly where we're at today and make sure to that we're gearing a lot of the resources uh, towards those areas in particular. All right, so where to begin? All right, so spring break 2020. So you know what, halfway through your term, uh, you're being asked to rapidly change your course online, you're not alone. Um, you know, for the first time in five years, uh, both of my classes, um, I'm chair of my department, so I've got a course release, but most of my, both of my classes this semester were face-to-face. -face. That almost never happens. And guess what? <laughs> right before spring break, uh, like many of you asked, hey, you know what? Uh, when we get back from spring break, you're going fully online. But good news is you don't have to make some drastic changes uh, based on some you know, research uh, and some great resources that are coming out um, in the last couple of weeks or so. This community, not only the community of leadership education, but of higher education generally, has been really great with sharing things. Uh, this uh, article I read, in fact, yesterday from Inside Higher Ed was saying, hey, you know what? You really have three options. You can run your class live with Zoom if you want to continue that face-to-face -face interaction uh, in a virtual way. You can pre-record your lectures, um, which is more of a business-as-usual type of transition, or you can skip the video entirely uh, and move to more of an asynchronous format. And we'll talk about some strategies and resources for all three of those particular options. So really, really briefly, um, so according to the ILA's Directory of Leadership Programs, which is a great resource if you haven't seen that, um, and that was uh, some recent support from the Leadership Learning Research Center at Florida State University. Um, there's about 2,000 leadership programs in that directory, and more than half offer blended or online courses. Um, so that is certainly a direction we're moving in as a field. And in the study that um, I conducted in 2016, uh, we learned a lot about what leadership educators are doing in their, in their online courses. So in particular, we found that discussion-based pedagogies, uh, that is discussion boards in the online, that had the highest mean scores. So those were used more often than any other type of instructional strategy. And that makes sense because that also happens in the face-to-face -face settings. Uh, discussion, interactive lecture and discussion, any type of discussion, small group discussion, those were the types of pedagogies or instructional strategies that were used more often than any others in our face-to-face -face spaces. And we're a constructivist, discipline. We're dialogical. We learn from the experiences of others. Um, and like, and it's important that we share our own experiences and reflect on them. And that is a big part of leadership education. So that's no surprise. Um, when we look at the types of instructional strategies that we use, you know what, we're actually not that much different when we move online than when we um, were when we were in our face to face environments. So you can see, you know, class discussion um, is still being used quite a bit. Uh, they're just moved to discussion boards. Uh, their instructor and student share. They might be led by the instructor. Uh, it could be group discussions that are facilitated in different ways. We still use a lot of self-assessments and, and instruments, um, whether it be StrengthsFinder or Myers-Briggs or the LPI, whatever it is that your institution is using or whatever you're using in your class. Um, but that is an important instructional strategy. Case studies, media clips, still things that are being used quite a bit. So not too much changes um, as far as the type of instructional strategy. It just changes in how we might facilitate it for our students. Um, as far as assessment strategy use, that is, you know, students' overall weight uh, in our course grade and, you know, what students are being asked to do, um, some of these things still rang true. You know, research projects and presentations are just as important. Uh, major writing and research papers or some type of term paper, short papers, still being used quite a bit class participation and attendance. And you know, setting that expectation of what that participation looks like is gonna be really important in the online class. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And by read and respond, we mean, hey, you know, read this chapter in the book, respond to these particular questions, perhaps that might be in the back of the book uh, of, of a particular chapter or something that you've posted. And so these are all really, really 
um, easy transfers, which again, we'll talk about in just a moment. The reason I've got this one highlighted, group projects and presentations, uh, there is something really interesting about what happens when we move face-to-face -to, -face to online, which is group projects and presentations fell out of that top 10. I think it fell down to like 16 or 17 um, on the list of online assessment strategies and how much weight that had for an online class. And, you know, the question is, hey, you know what, um, does that mean that when we move a class online that all of a sudden um, working with others is not important? Uh, I, I would disagree. No, it's still very important, but there's some anxiety about uh, facilitating virtual teams. But you know what, we don't have to lose that. There are so many more tools and resources out there for facilitating really, really strong virtual uh, team and group projects. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But we know a little bit less about how to facilitate learning um, in online courses. So pedagogy is still important and we'll talk about some tips for for doing that. A uh, quick shout out to an amazing group of, uh, of women. Uh, some of the resources that I'm going to share with you today actually came from this pre-conference session that we did at the ILA Global Conference in Atlanta in 2016. So Josie, Virginia, Lisa, Kathy, and Kirsten, uh, lots of, uh, you know, lots of love to y'all and, and definitely some shout outs to the resources that you shared uh, when we did this full day pre-con years ago. And you'll see some of these resources being shared during our session today um, and some of these uh, amazing brilliant women have, have offered to share some time with us going uh, forward we'll talk about some drop-in zoom meetings that we're going to facilitate uh, to continue this conversation and be able to answer some more of your questions going forward after this webinar all right so some evidence-based practice just for online courses general generally so First is communicate, communicate, communicate there's nothing more important than that in fact a research has shown that with respect to student evaluations for online classes, the number one, the most statistically significant factor of how well students uh, are going to report your classes when they're online is that communication. How often did the instructor show up, communicate, post an announcement, um, interact on the discussion boards perhaps, or uh, share something via email. Just be present as much as you possibly can. You know, don't overdo it, uh, but but be present. You know, in all this uncertainty, you know, you need to explain as clearly as you can in a variety of places what students can expect about the course you know, this week, next week, um, set deadlines and show what these deadlines are. Um, with that, you know, be clear and set your expectations. Um, post in discussion boards, um, tell students um, how many words you want in a post. Um, how many posts do you need them to post? Um, Timeframes, deadlines, uh, what does participation look like? All the things that you might have already set out uh, clearly in your course syllabi. Uh, this is a time uh, for brevity, um, you know, uh, if you will, uh, or, or lack thereof, depending on your approach, um, to make sure that, and my colleagues always joke with me about how long my syllabi are, that they might be 16 or 20 pages, but, you know, you're dealing with someone who has a doctorate in curriculum and instruction. Um, and so, you know, the more, the, the merrier in, in this standpoint, um, over explain because students are going to want to know what you expect from them. And that could also mean um, expectations for synchronous discussion. If you go that way with Zoom web conferencing, um, it could be muting when you're not speaking, raise your hand uh, if you need either virtually or physically uh, on the screen when you want to um, chime in or, or add your opinion to a, a discussion, when to use chat, um, you know, as well, students are really going to want to know about assignments, uh, due dates, especially high stakes assessments moving forward and what that will look like. Um, be intentional, you know, continue to think about, you know, do I really need this assignment or that assignment? Not that you have to change things drastically, but just to reassess some of those things. Um, and with technology, you know, provide resources for technology, but never integrate technology just for the sake of integrating it. You know, continue to think about, you know, what you need to be effective in your course online, um, as well as what materials might be available online. And it's really great that many, many, many publishers um, have moved forward with um, offering a lot of their content online in digital forms, uh, Vital Source, and, um, you know, and so many different publishers have, have done that. So kudos to those groups for uh, being flexible during this time. 
All right, so we'll talk a little bit about our learning management systems. Uh, again, talk about some of those quote unquote low hanging fruit, and by those I mean these easily transferable instructional strategies. And then we'll level up a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the intermediate uh, or those instructional strategies that might take a little bit more uh, you know, time from you or, or planning, but still um, very much uh, intentional and experiential in their nature, which is so important for leadership education. All right, so our good old friends Blackboard and uh, Moodle and Canvas, so hopefully you see your LMS uh, up there. And so these are great because this is where a lot of things are gonna live for your students and you may have never used these before. You might have been a little old school with using your grade book and, and doing things uh, internally, but there are so many great ways to organize your course through these LMSs. So within these is where you will facilitate a lot of your learning, you know, posting links to your class meetings, uh, posting your discussion boards, uh, ha uh, having a place where students can submit assignments and that you can give feedback. So make sure that within these spaces that you emphasize announcements that you differentiate between things that might be more reflective in nature or discussion in nature. Think about what you want students to provide that the whole class can see and those things that perhaps you want them to, to keep private between you um, and them. And, uh, you know, the Google Apps for Education, I'll talk about those a little bit today as well. These are just fantastic ways to share information, particularly in the synchronous space, um, as they really create some opportunities uh, for you to be interactive and for students to contribute and really facilitate some inclusive uh, pedagogy um, and the sense of community within this space that you'll be teaching in for the duration of your semester, perhaps in the summer as well. I know that uh, University of Southern Maine has also moved to online in the first seven week block of the summer semester and we will see where things move for the rest of the summer and fall. All right, poll question number two. So, so I can get a sense too of where we're at. So how will you be teaching your leadership course the rest of the term? Are you going to be going 100% asynchronous? And that would include you know, posting your lectures um, and again, keeping everything online with no class meetings. Or are you gonna be going 100% synchronous, um, which would be you know, some class meetings, uh, again, business as usual perhaps with class meetings via web conferencing such as Zoom or Skype or uh, Google, uh, Google Meets or whatever it is that your institution has. So we'll give you all about 20 to 30 seconds or so to enter your polling responses. About 10 more seconds. All right, we can close that poll and see what our results look like. And polling is another great instructional strategy. If you've got an option to do this within, you know, your Zoom or your uh, your other LMS, um, or excuse me, your web conferencing um, platform, whether they be online, um, there's some really, really great polling uh, options out there. Let's see, where's our, our results here? Oh wow, so we're about 60-40, so 59% uh, going synchronous using web conferencing uh, via, as uh, Zoom, which I keep going back to because that's what we use at our institution, and about 40% will be doing asynchronous. Great, thank you so much. So we're about 60-40, so I'll make sure to uh, spend a little bit more time uh, talking about, uh, about that. All right, so our low-hanging fruit, and I was jazzed up when I saw that, uh, when I grabbed this piece of click art. So uh, here is some low-hanging fruit. So discussion. So um, if you're going to be, and just because you have a synchronous class doesn't mean that you won't be doing some discussion online. And so um, discussion boards, very, very, very uh, important way and strategy for moving things online. And you don't have to be static in the way that you do that. You can you know, do just a straight up group discussion where you might post something, uh, could be, you know, uh, chapter uh, discussion questions, could be a case study, could be watch this video and respond. Um, you could put individuals into smaller breakout groups um, within the LMS. And so those are great ways to get some discussion going. It could be something where only the instructor participates uh, with respect to posting uh, the content that is going to be responded to as well as moderating, but you can also um, involve students in that process. Ask them to moderate discussion uh, on particular topics 
uh, you know, here or there throughout the course of a week or, or a module. Um, and you can also, uh, you know, just to kind of push that even farther, you know, have the students completely moderate that um, and give feedback and, and really be responsible for moving the conversation forward. And it's up to the individual instructor about how much or how little they want to, um, you know, jump in and, and voice their opinion with respect to the, the and, uh, excuse me, the discussion boards. So there's a lot more continuity than you might think with moving the discussion that you might have in class, as long as you keep it topical online. So uh, a good question, and, and this uh, was one of the lessons learned that I'm glad I learned early in my career of teaching online. So what happens when you just when you assign a discussion board assignment and ask students to respond to their peers before a set deadline? Well, if it's, you're anything like what's happened in uh, the classes I was teaching in my first uh, couple semesters online, it was usually, well, they would wait until the last, I don't know, five or six hours. So if you had a midnight on a, on a you know, early on a Monday morning, so, a, you know, 11.59 on a Sunday night, at about 5 or 6 p.m., those responses started coming in. And uh, But your real go-getters earlier in the week would say, hey, there's no one to respond to. And so I learned this threaded discussion model, which I'll share, uh, which was such a game changer for me in my online classes. And this goes back to setting those expectations. And so it works like this, you know, in 30 seconds or less. Um, this is more of the instructor-led process where you would post something for your learners to respond to. It could be watching a video clip, a case study, again, responding to different discussion questions, and then have a uh, set due date for that initial post. Let's say you have a two-week module. You would tell students, hey, post your initial post by the end of the first week, and then once that time frame stops, you have a second time frame set for perhaps the end of that second week, and that's second week is that time frame where individuals can uh, respond and so again remember to say hey respond to at least two of your peers in each thread or you know 500 words or whatever it might be uh, but this has really enhanced that experience for students so that there is a lot more interaction um, that goes on um, during that that time frame in that space so some resources um, the ILA's Pause for Pedagogy series, if you're not familiar with that newsletter series and the interface, it is fantastic. And in 2018, Lisa Endersby and I, who co-edit that, that newsletter, uh, we did a whole series on technology enhanced learning. And, and shout out to Deborah DeRuver, who helps to edit that as, and is on the ILA staff. But there are some great articles on that. Um, there is a great, um, some great resources on Faculty Focus, which is by Magna Publications. If you were to Google Faculty Focus, you would just find tons of articles on teaching in higher education um, as well. There's a great uh, chapter in the book uh, that Kathleen Guthrie and I wrote uh, about in the, the, our book, The Role of Leadership Educators Transforming Learning, a whole chapter on discussion um, and for leadership uh, educators. All right, so let's move to case studies. Um, so that is, again, so the, the case, the Instructional strategies that we're focusing on are those that are most widely used by leadership educators based on the research that I've done. So what's a case study? You know, so this is where we're, an exam we're examining, you know, oral stories, written cases, um, and looking for uh, effective or ineffective leadership. And so um, these are used for a variety of learning goals. They're really, really powerful. Um, give students this opportunity to really play with this idea, you know, and don't forget, you know, we're in the middle of a really, really good case study uh, right now. So don't don't forget, you know, the obvious and the, our current events. And so these could be competitive. Think about ILA's uh, case study competition that they facilitate. Um, each year at the global conference, you can have a case study competition within your classes. Um, they can be media based. They can be topical. Um, there's a great resource that Stanford's Business School puts out uh, about uh, that are video cases. Uh, check that out uh, at the end of every chapter of Nordhaus's Leadership Theory and Practice, which is the most widely used textbook for leadership theory. There's cases, um, and we have a whole chapter on case study methods in the back of our uh, textbook. Or excuse me, back of our book, uh, The Role of Leadership Educators. Um, again, and this uh, this was a great meme that came out recently. Um, so uh, class of 2020, you're going to have a great answer to any uh, interview you might have going forward. Uh, but, you know, for reflection, um, which is another great instructional strategy. So in this scenario, you know, this is where we reflect on our experiences and really emphasize uh, Kolb's model uh, of experiential learning. Uh, some activities might be digital stories, 
reflective journals, posting on social media. So there are a lot of different ways to continue this process of reflection. Uh, there's a great, if you've ever done like a values um, auction in your class, there's a great online resource from the Center for Creative Leadership, the Values uh, Able Leader Project. Uh, there's a great book on journal keeping that provides tons of resources about that, as well as uh, chapter 12 of uh, Role of Leadership Educators is all about reflection. So, you know, continue to keep reflection in your class and know that is something that you can continue to do. Uh, whether you want to have students do short papers uh, or short writing one minute papers in your synchronous class or if you want that to be something that is more static and that students will submit uh, via asynchronous media clips hey who's not binge watching at home right now uh, and so uh, you know use this strategy continue to use this strategy whether it's having students go back and write some of these things um, or showing it uh, during your synchronous or asynchronous classes. Uh, from the synchronous standpoint, I found that Zoom and these others don't do a great job of showing a video. Usually the strategy there is, hey, we're gonna pause for a second, here's the link, um, you know, we're, let's go watch this, uh, you know, make sure that everybody has access to this content. Um, and, you know, the video is nine minutes long or the TED Talk is 15 minutes long. Let's go watch this and then we'll come back to our Zoom meeting in 15 minutes. So it's a great way to facilitate that. Um, you know, so you can use media as cases, uh, and there are some great um, there are some great resources for that. The facilitation and activity guide for exploring leadership for college students who want to make a difference has a great some great activities that use media. Um, and um, you know, there's just some great you know the office is a great one um, that has some great leadership lessons. But there's so many options available to you. Um, Denny Roberts, who's a great scholar in our field, you know, he he uh, shared something with me in the last couple of days uh, that showed me some great examples of videos that, you know, that are able to really enhance and provoke online uh, deeper leadership learning. You know, there are a lot of tough issues. We're dealing with a lot of tough issues at the local level, at the state level, globally. Um, and so, you know, let's make sure that we bring that into our classrooms to really help students learn how to cross, uh, excuse me, how to cross cultural, national, and other types of uh, borders in their lives. Uh, and so we are, you know, again, going back to this question of leadership for what, but we have a responsibility to really make sure that some of these, you know, tough questions and tough issues uh, do uh, raise their head in our leadership classes. Self-assessments and instruments. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. So these are, you know, where students complete these questionnaires. Um, you know, you can still use this. If students have already taken one of these assessments earlier in the semester, um, they can still you can still facilitate conversation and discussion on these. Have them reflect, have students go into small group discussions if you're doing uh, synchronous or asynchronous learning. Uh, students can do their own leadership development plans based on what they've learned based, uh, from the results of their assessments. And we've got a whole chapter on how to use self-assessments and instruments in chapter 15 of the role of leadership educators transforming learning. So uh, just some great, a great pedagogy and a great way to continue uh, the conversation and uh, this particular instructional strategy. All right, so we're going to level up a bit um, and talk about some strategies that do take a little bit more uh, TLC from your side, uh, but it looks like a lot of our of our group, a lot of our webinar attendees are teaching their course via synchronous, via uh, web conferencing. So you don't have to change uh, much, but you do have to get comfortable with how you facilitate this uh, and so going back to what i shared earlier about setting expectations you know making sure everyone has the technology that they've got a webcam they know how to control their audio um, that you you can continue to have guest speakers uh, you can have breakout rooms uh, in a lot of these um, you can still do think pair shares you can um, integrate interaction and feedback um, there are you can continue to make this an organic and constructivist process um, an example that I'll show that integrates uh, Google Suite and uh, web conferencing um, that I think is really, really fantastic, and I hope that you all will, will pick this up. So here's, here's an example from a class uh, that I did several years ago um, where we started to set expectations at the beginning of a class. So what we would do um, is we would share a Google Doc that everybody had access to, and I asked them about some experiences they had had in um, online and synchronous learning spaces and what were some of the things that the teacher did that was really effective and what were some of the things that the instructor did in that space that was also effective both in that both in that best class they ever had 
as well as that worst class they ever had. And so as you can see from the video, students would start posting um, their different responses. And so we had this inclusive, this kind of virtual whiteboard of space for everybody to interact and share their, their ideas, uh, which is kind of like popcorning that might um, occur in a face-to-face -face class. And so uh, this was a great way to set expectations and, and facilitate um, the voice and the ideas and empower students um, within this class setting. And so um, some strategies for this include, uh, although it's not on in this particular example, but having students choose a color of text that they use. So you always know that, you know, Jerry's doing this or Muhammad's doing this or Julie's doing this. So you know what color uh, text that they use or just uh, ending everything that they post with their initials. Um, and so there's some great strategies uh, for doing this. Uh, and I hope that, you know, this is something that you can that you can take on and implement in your class. Utilize that Google technology, uh, those interactive Google Docs and Google Slides. You can have students create presentations on Google Slides um, as well during their classes. Uh, and just to show you how easy this is, um, Ryan, if you could throw this um, this URL into the into the chat bar, um, we can actually uh, share this information and, and show you just how easy it is. This tiny URL here. Um, teaching leadership online. So if we come over um, to this uh, Google Doc over here, um, we can actually, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll take maybe 60 seconds, uh, two minutes tops. Um, if you wanted to post, you know, what are some tips that you have for easing the transition uh, from face-to-face -to, -face to online courses? So I posted a couple articles um, here earlier, but you could, you know, anything that you want to share that might be helpful um, for your peers, um, you know, whether we've got, and gosh, we've got over 500 participants on this webinar. So there, this is something that is so easy to do. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, transfer some of the tips and things that uh, that you all post. So anything that you post right now, but feel free to go back and revisit this because we're going to organize this and post it to uh, another website called Teaching Leadership Online uh, that I've that I put together to uh, share with the community. But there's also some posts for. Um, different types of instructional strategies, whether they be case studies or reflection or media clips. And this is going to be organic. And that's one of the great things about these is they are organic. And as you see, your your, your peers here, we're creating our own community of practice and, and sharing something. Please feel free to visit this, uh, return to this and visit it in the future. But this is great. Uh, and it's really great to see everybody jumping in and all of our anonymous uh, farm animals and, and other uh, members of the jungle um, joining us here on on Google Docs. So uh, so thank you and please continue to uh, contribute to that over the next uh, you know couple days or weeks and we'll keep this document uh, living for you. And uh, for those of you that might watch the recording of this webinar, um, just know that hey you can contribute to this too um, but if you are watching the recording we're not sure what it might look like um, sometimes the video doesn't capture uh, superbly on the recording um, and also if you're on a uh, on a smart device like an i like a an ipad or a phone you may not be able to have the same google doc functionality um, as others but awesome thanks for being a part of that learning exercise for me and i hope you found that to be pretty easy to um, access um, and and fun to uh, to play around with. So last but not least, as far as the instructional strategies that we're going to look at is group work. Uh, again, so this was one of those uh, pedagogies or instructional strategies and assessment strategies where when we moved online, all of a sudden, and this was fully asynchronous online, when we moved online, we found that this way dropped off uh, as one of the instructional strategies that we um, offered for our students in our classes. And again, is working with others less important because we're teaching leadership online? Of course not. Um, but it can certainly present some anxiety for uh, instructors in facilitating this strategy online for uh, the learners in our class. But this is equally as important. Uh, it just, these become virtual teams. Luckily, we have so many more tools at our disposal uh, and resources, particularly the web conferencing, um, you know, gone are the days uh, mostly of conference calls, but you know, these are things that we're lucky that we're able to utilize. So um, that being said, just like you wouldn't just throw your students to the wolves, um, <laughs> I hope, um, in your face-to-face -face class, you need to focus on group development. Think about Tuckman's, Tuckman's stages of group development. You still need to focus on the norming uh, and the storming and really give students that are in virtual teams now, hey, they may have met before class or after class, 
um, in order to plan for their group projects or presentations that they're doing later in the semester. Uh, give still give them that time to do that um, and or empower them to meet outside of uh, your regular class meetings uh, if they're synchronous and um, hopefully your institution also gives them the opportunity to use you know Google Hangouts or Google Meets or Zoom or Skype or whatever or what have you encourage them to meet that way um, so that they can prepare better for their uh, synchronous uh, presentations. Um, they can also present those synchronously using Zoom. As we're doing a screen share right now, you can do a screen share in Zoom and a lot of these other web conferencing uh, forums. So uh, whether you're going to have them facilitate something fully synchronous or record a presentation and post it for the class, uh, there are so many ways to make sure that you still continue this really, really important pedagogy uh, that leads to so many great learning outcomes in leadership education. Uh, some resources that, that I love for this, there's a great book, uh, Virtual Team Building Games, that uh, I've adopted, and you can use those in pretty much any format, just really great um, activities for that. I will say, you know, kind of a, a, in, my, in my own uh, space, um, and, and Ryan uh, is a part of this team, so the Leadership Education Academy that ILA puts on every year, uh, we are a completely virtual team until we all come uh, together uh, each summer to facilitate our workshop. And uh, we're in, uh, gosh, four different countries and uh, all across uh, the United States as well. And one of the things that we learned that was really important over the years is that we set aside usually about 10 to 15 minutes at the beginning of each of our uh, facilitator team meetings to do virtual team building. And they have those have been so important. Think of them as virtual icebreakers. So don't forget how important those things are in your uh, synchronous classes just to start you know building that same sense of community that hopefully you created face to face you can continue that sense of community online another great uh, article about uh, online teamwork collaboration and communication that came from again one of those new directions for student leadership chapters uh, is just fan a fantastic resource and we've got a whole chapter on team-based learning in the role of leadership educators transforming learning some other resources um, that I love. Oh, one other, uh, excuse me, one other example, and then we'll, I'll share some other resources and then we'll move quickly to, to the Q&A. Um, I did have to completely change one of the virtual, uh, the group work assignments I had in my class, which was one of my favorites called Leadership Theater, where uh, this was an undergraduate introduction to leadership class, where at the end of the semester, they were gonna work in teams of four or five and put on a skit where they would demonstrate dis different leadership concepts and theories. Um, for the class and then facilitate a discussion about what they uh, performed in their skit. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little hard to do a skit uh, on Zoom. And so I resurrected an old activity called Leadership in Film that students are gonna do instead where they're going to use uh, clips no more than 10 minutes. So it's good to set that expectation. So somewhere probably between five and 10 minutes of a clip for a movie or a show that they uh, particularly like and demonstrates some particular leadership concepts, models or theories from the course. Um, so they'll show those clips, uh, moderate some discussion around that. Um, and that will be the presentation that they'll give. Everybody has to be involved from their group in some way, shape or form. So that was a great way to kind of still keep the idea of that activity, but still uh, maintain it in an online space. So sad to see leadership theater um, go away, but excited to resurrect uh, leadership and film for my students in that class this semester. All right, so some other resources that I love. There's a Leadership Educator podcast, uh, which uh, you know, I'm very biased of some uh, selfless promotion, but uh, uh, Lauren Bullock and I, who's an amazing uh, faculty member over at uh, Temple, University, her and I have uh, been embarking on this Leadership Educator podcast, which is uh, supported by the Association of Leadership Educators and a gift uh, from Keith Herndon's group over the University of Georgia. Um, so just a great resource there. We've also done a podcast on this particular idea. Um, again, I can't say enough about the new directions for student leadership, just so many great uh, chapters and teaching tools. This is written by and for leadership educators. And there was a great issue a few years ago uh, in 2017 about going digital in student leadership. Um, the book I kept mentioning, Kathy Guthrie and I wrote about the role of leadership educators transforming learning and hot off the presses from Information Age Publishing is a, a whole book of instructional and incestive strategies uh, for teaching leadership. And we organize that by instructional strategy. For example, one chapter is case studies, another chapter is uh, reflection, another one's role play uh, and simulation in games. And in each one of those chapters is a an activity 
um, that is a technology enhanced activity that you can use online. So check that out. Another great New Directions uh, series about engaging the digital uh, generation. And I talked a little bit about this virtual team building games book. Um, and also earlier, I talked about uh, faculty focus, which is just loaded with tools for online teaching and learning. Um, and so please feel free to post some of the resources that you love on that Google Doc that I shared. And uh, you know, I'll close before Q&A with, hey, you got this. Like, we can do this. You know, it's not rocket science. Uh, we love what we do. We teach leadership. We're increasing the capacity of students to, to go out there and, and, you know, and be the change that they want to see in the world. Um, you know, this is just, you know, a minor, uh, you know, a, a, a minor drop in, in, in what we're doing and uh, we can make this happen. And uh, we have a community, a strong community of practitioners and our associations uh, and our colleagues. Uh, we can we can do this. So I'll move from there to, to Q&A and and uh, hand it over to Ryan. Um, and just as he's pulling up the questions uh, that he's going to send to me, uh, just to note that uh, we're going to, if you want to continue the conversation, and I, I believe that uh, this was shared with registrants, uh, next um, next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to do a drop-in Q&A uh, over here uh, at this uh, at this tiny URL, and um, I will we'll set up a, a form for you to send your questions to us uh, beforehand, and we're going to have some experts uh, that will join us, uh, many of those um, will be some of the amazing, brilliant women that I shared that were part of that pre-conference session from 2016. And I hope that you will join us to continue the conversation and uh, fields, uh, we'll be able to field your questions. But let's jump right in now to field some, fielding some of your questions here. So I will take a look and see what questions we have from Ryan from our amazing participants today. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. That was a lot of information. Let me go ahead and answer the most common question, which is, will a recording or a copy of the slides be made available? A recording will be available uh, of this webinar, so you'll have a chance to go back through and uh, take a closer look at all of the amazing resources that have been provided. Uh, one of the early questions, and I think it's an important one, just to make sure that we're all um, understanding the terminology that's used here, Dan, is can you clarify the term synchronous and asynchronous? Sure, sure. Thank you for, for asking that. I apologize if I wasn't clear about that before. So um, when we think about modalities and, and learning modalities and delivery modes, so uh, asynchronous is 100% uh, fully online, which means no class meetings whatsoever. Um, in any shape or form, uh, whether it, they had, you know, whether they're, it's a blended format or what have you, this is, you never meet, you're never asked to meet at a particular time. Uh, and so if you were to register for that class as a student, you know, at a particular institution, you would know there was no expectation you had to be anywhere at a particular time. Where synchronous um, is this idea of where we're still going to have class meetings, live class meetings that meet at a certain uh, time. Uh, unfortunately, they're unlikely to be face-to-face um, but they will certainly be facilitated in this day and age in, in one of our web conferencing um, platforms or perhaps conference calling, depending on what you uh, might facilitate at your institution. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, re <laughs> relatedly, there, was, uh, there were a number of comments when we did the poll around asynchronous or asynchronous format uh, that indicated a hybrid approach. So right. could you comment a little bit further on some of the pedagogies or considerations that might be useful for a hybrid format? Yeah, and, and so, you know, I guess, luckily, a lot of the teaching that I've done, uh, particularly in our graduate uh, programs at, at University of Southern Maine, have been in the blended format. So we would meet about every week or so um, for live class meetings. And, and in fact, uh, over the last five years or so, that had been a combination of students that would physically come to our Portland campus um, or our Lewiston campus a few years ago, as well as those that would remote in via Zoom or before that Adobe Connect. And so we would have what we always called the Brady Bunch up on the screen or the Hollywood Squares, uh, which we're all now very familiar with, um, interacting with those students that actually attended via class. And it was about a 50-50 split. Um, and so we'd meet about every other week or so and conversation would occur um, both in class, obviously during those live class meetings, but also would occur online. One of the, a great way to integrate those two, um, if you go back to this idea of students moderating discussion, uh, an assignment that I loved uh, that students really, really dove into 
was we would assign, let's say, a research article that was associated with a particular chapter. So let's say we were talking about uh, situational uh, and contingency styles of leadership in a graduate leadership theory course. Um, you know, there'd be a whole chapter on that, uh, and then we would assign, you know, there's a great uh, study about uh, being directive or empowering um, and what that looks like in the workforce. And there's a this a group of scholars actually interviewed uh, doctors that worked uh, in a residency type of uh, situation at uh, an emergency hospital, um, an emergency room. And so how directive or empowering were these physicians with their residents? And so uh, the student that had this, they would start the conversation online and uh, post you know, three slides and some discussion questions about this article online in a discussion board format and students would respond they would be responsible for moderating that discussion and then the following week we'd come into class and they would have to continue that discussion and also integrate some of the things that their peers said on the discussion board so we had this synthesis um, of what happened online and what happened in class so students are responsible for building uh, some skills that capacity to facilitate discussion both online and face to face so that was a very very blended format and an example of a of, of an activity that uh, has really gone off really really well uh, when we've done our blended classes great uh, we have a question here can you touch on distinctions between undergraduate graduate and doctoral level leadership <laughs> What level is this presentation geared towards mostly? Uh, this person teaches in a doctoral leadership program and finds that their adult learners uh, are much different demographic and perhaps needs than when they were teaching undergraduate and how that plays out in online education. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, certainly the amount of reading varies considerably. Um, I've taught online classes at, for, for, you know, all the way up and down those different uh, levels that you mentioned, Ryan. Um, you know, I, I think that the amount of writing, yeah, the amount of writing and reading certainly uh, is the biggest difference in the range of what I expect my students to do. If it's in an introduction to leadership class at the, you know, 100 or 200 level versus, you know, our advanced graduate students or doctoral students, um, you know, and also, uh, expecting students to facilitate certain things. I think that's much more appropriate, not that there aren't outstanding undergraduates, but I think that uh, masters and doctoral students, you know, have more, uh, you know, life experiences and experiences in general that give them uh, the opportunities to really be successful in moderating discussion um, in areas of their own expertise or diving into, you know, advanced research and scholarship and, and really being prepared to do that. You know, meet students where they're at, you know, think about those situational factors um, of what, you know, students are able to do, um, as well as you mentioned demographics and, and other factors. If you're using media clips, make sure that they are in line with the, uh, uh, you know, American Disabilities Act, make sure there's subtitles um, or that that option is, is available. I learned that lesson the hard way. Um, just, you know, it, it wasn't something that, had, that, that I had considered um, when I taught an online class, gosh, five or six years ago, and a student said, hey, you know, um, I, I have a, you know, a listening disability, and um, I noticed that one of the videos that you posted didn't have subtitles. It had even occurred to me, and you know, we worked with a transcriptionist and made that happen, and going forward, I always use uh, videos that have transcripts available or subtitles. Um, so I, I think just being intentional and, you know, how you would approach any undergraduate, graduate, or, or, or doctoral level class, you know, and, and knowing what's appropriate content for, for that developmental uh, readiness uh, of your students. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question. Uh, a lot of questions around virtual group work, and <laughs> one in particular. No given given where we are um culturally and socially right now is is wondering uh if group work might be extra challenging given how students are uh do you feel it could be detrimental at this point in time or would it actually serve to help build community yeah i mean i i think that you know there's there's going to be a learning curve at the beginning no matter what um i was surprised to learn that there was, you know, I, I guess, you know, doing Zoom meetings, I probably average one and a half Zoom meetings a day in my own work, uh, collaborating with other, you know, with colleagues in the field and, and some of the other teaching and other 
you know, meetings that we have at our university and snow days, um, yeah, do happen in New England versus where I uh, started my career, which is in Tampa, Florida, which if there's a snow day, something's happening. Um, and so, um, you know, getting used to, to doing that and setting expectations, you know, we, um, we got the announcement that we were moving fully online a couple of weeks ago. And so I did get to meet with um, my two face-to-face -face classes one last time in person before we moved. And so I said, hey, everybody get out your smartphone. Let's see if we can make this Zoom meeting work. You know, download the app, get out your laptop or whatever. Um, and many of them had never used a web conferencing which is actually a great skill to develop for these students, um, particularly at the undergraduate level or at any level, um, you know, to be, to, to be quite honest, because this is how we collaborate as scholars, as professionals, um, building this uh, capacity and this skill set of running effective online virtual meetings, um, setting an agenda, um, facilitating conversation, all of these things that are just as important about quote unquote running an effective meeting um, in a live setting are equally as important. In fact, now they're more important um, in our new normal um, in the online space. And so um, I would, you know, think about making sure that a you're comfortable uh, facilitating that, and you're going to learn along the way. But also um, giving students the resources that they need. Uh, there are some great Zoom how tos and best practices for Zoom and best practices for web conferencing. Uh, some of those were posted. Um, on the uh, Google Doc that I posted, there was a great post from uh, Stanford's um, Learning Designers that included some best practices for Zoom. So, you know, just thinking about um, what is what does how I would normally facilitate my class in person mean for facilitating my class online, and what are some ways to transfer that uh, without there being you know, too much anxiety and, and for virtual teams, same, same goes Not you know, um, how will you prepare students for the next generation of the workforce where people are global, we're meeting online, we're facilitating things online. I shared the story about the Leadership Education Academy. Uh, we prepare the entire experience online uh, via web conferencing and, and other formats and um, as well as integrating the Google Docs and some of these other, um, you know, project management uh, softwares, depending on what your expectations are for your students in their virtual teams and groups. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, what else, Ryan? <laughs> another question here. We have a, a ton with more than 500 uh, participants here, uh, far more than we're going to be able to get to. But in an in-person class, you can judge student reactions, right? The, the body language, including responding to humor, et cetera. How do you get that kind of reading when you're online with 30 students and you're seeing little squares on a screen? Sure, so that's, that's, a great, um, that's a great question. Uh, there are some of these web conferencing, uh, like, like Zoom, I think they, you can ra have somebody raise their hand. There's like a virtual way to raise their hand. Um, you can also, some have like a thumbs up, thumbs down, like, how are you feeling about this? You know, I've, I've seen that happen in webinars and in other uh, web conferencing, you know, so, you know, is everybody getting this? Should I move on to the next concept? You know, does anybody need an example of this? Um, you know, just like you might gauge that um, in a face-to-face -face class. Um, this might be a way to, um, you know, you can ask students, uh, you know, copy and paste an emoji that characterizes how you feel about where we are uh, in response to this particular content or this module that we uh, that we just covered uh, or, or a meme uh, in good taste again that all comes back to setting expectations and making sure that people are appropriate the uh, hey would you want this on the cover of the New York Times or would you want your grandma to see this is always a good rule of thumb um, with uh, what students might post and and you know just having expectations and rules too around what goes in the chat bar or doesn't um, as well as you know, I mean, also you could have students um, write down on a piece of paper, uh, draw a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and literally hold up their their question or their or their their feeling. Um, you know, again, use use the camera um, and and the video space, uh, just like you might um, in a in a regular uh, in a regular class. And again, the polling um, option does exist in many of these web conferencing uh, interfaces, and so to use those um, just like you would uh, pedagogically. Uh, in your classroom uh, if uh, when you were meeting face-to-face. -face. All right. Great questions. 
Yeah, just we have time for just a couple more here, probably. Uh, there's a number of questions around uh, feedback and assessment in yeah, sure. online learning, especially. So uh, I have found that the grading scheme drives behavior regarding discussion board participation, especially. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on effective options for evaluating discussion board participation? Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, rubrics are really important. Um, if you want something from students, you've, you've got to ask them for it explicitly. This goes back to that idea of communication, 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 and setting expectations. Um, some of my colleagues in my department uh, ask for a particular word count. Um, they might say, in addition to the word count, um, here's what a good response looks like. You know, uh, um, one I, I borrowed from one of my uh, uh, professor emeriti that said something on the syllabus with the effect of, uh, that's great, yay, you nailed it, me too, is not going to get you a lot of points um, in the discussion board. But, um, you know, what adds value? What continues the conversation? Um, can you share an example of, you know, something that your uh, peers may have uh, posted or can you share your own example? Can you connect it to um, one of the readings or some media that was shown, you know, those are really, those are, that tends to be the feedback I give in the first couple of weeks, whether it be a, a graduate or an undergraduate class is literally pushing this idea of like, hey, if you're not connecting um, what I'm asking you for to your own experiences, you're missing the point of experiential leadership education that literally creates new connections in the brain um, and you know being intentional and purposeful about um, making those connections between content experiences and what we're asking you to post it's not just busy work um, and so showing them what what is worth the mo what is worth more points what good posts look like um, you can also some learning management systems allow people to rate posts with stars um, or likes um, and so being really clear, again, uh, I keep saying word count, but that can be really important if that's important to you um, and how many responses and during what time frame. Um, and if that is going to be a centerpiece of your class and you need to alter that um, in place of some of the other activities or assignments, just let students know that, hey, you know what, um, your participation grade, um, half of it is now integrated into your discussion posts grade. Um, and then some, or if you had to drop something in place of more discussion, just be clear with your students. If you want a really vibrant discussion board, as Ryan said, hey, nothing motivates uh, extrinsically like points um, or a percentage of an overall grade. And so um, not saying that, you know, more than 50% of the class grade needs to be, uh, but as I showed in the research at the beginning of the webinar, um, that is a very popular way that students are assessed in uh, online classes. Uh, given given our current context right now, with so many classes moving online due to COVID-19, uh, most of our students have returned home for the rest of this semester. Do you have any recommendations for teaching online when students are in multiple time zones? That's a great question. Well, I, I think back to I mean, meeting, yeah, meeting students where they're at. If you know, and a good friend of ours uh, <laughs> who said, hey, I love what you guys are doing with this webinar, but I, I won't be joining you from Melbourne, uh, Australia, because it's 2 a.m. where I am. Uh, shout out to Nathan Eva, who's also one of our LEA facilitators. But, you know, do keep that in mind. International students that, you know, if they were able to, to, to make it back home, um, you know, I did for one of my classes, um, I did institute a doodle poll because I know that I knew about some students that were returning to Europe uh, to, to, to be home with their families. Um, and if it does take a doodle poll or other type of uh, method to find a uh, mutually uh, agreed upon and, and uh, accommodating meeting time, do it. Um, I, I think that has to be something that you take into consideration. You know, you can't expect someone to meet um, at a regular class time that might be 4 a.m. their time. So, you know, please be flexible. Um, that's another kind of best practice at this time that I've heard from a lot of my colleagues and a lot of our uh, amazing learning designers who are, uh, wow, are they on the front lines at, at universities uh, and colleges right now, those learning designers and, and, and you know, higher education development resource teams, uh, kudos to y'all for what you do. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, you know, be flexible with when you meet, uh, sh should you choose to continue your class in a synchronous 
uh, time frame and just find out from students, you know, a quick email or poll, you know, hey, you know, let me know in the next 48 hours, is anybody, um, is this time zone a big issue for anybody? You know, you might be surprised uh, where your learners uh, are from if you didn't initiate some of that conversation earlier in the term. All right, and I think our final question here, uh, very important. How have you been able to accommodate for intercultural differences when teaching online? It's a great question. Yeah, I think about um, one of the things that I um, will will miss in person, but I'm glad to be able to continue in the virtual setting. My introduction to leadership class was, I think, by far in my 12, 13 years of teaching, the most diverse class uh, from a you know a, a cultural and an an ethnic standpoint that I've ever had. I think we represent 10 different countries in a class of 18 or 19 students. Um, it's just amazing. And I think that, you know, any any type of communication and cultural uh, processes that you implemented in that face-to-face -face setting, um, you know, to continue that and to still be aware of um, not only the, the diversity of, uh, of culture, ethnicity, but of thought and, and approach, um, but understanding that um, it really goes back to that first, one of those first slides and, and tips about communication, communication, communication. Understand that some of those nuances and, and cultural differences, you know, think about the globe studies um, of leadership and interaction, you know, how those might come to play. So there is still a lot to be said about having conversations about uh, uh, discussion and communication and inclusivity um, and the process about how you will quote unquote hold yourselves and how you will communicate with each other in the online space. Uh, and just being open to that and being flexible and being welcoming uh, to that, um, to, to those differences that, that, may, that may naturally occur. Um, and diversity, there's power in diversity. And, um, you know, if, if that is something that, you're, uh, that you have in your classes, then that is great. That's adding value to um, the learning experience that uh, not only you're going to get as the instructor, but also to the students in your courses. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for participating in this webinar. In closing, I just want to encourage you to take advantage of this community practice that we're forming here today. We're living in unusual times and contexts are changing rapidly. Uh, let's continue to build community, share resources, and support one another as much as I know you're dedicated to supporting your students. Thank you to Dan Jenkins for your time today, as well as his contributions to helping us better understand our own field. And finally, on behalf of the International Leadership Association, thank you for joining this Leadership Perspectives webinar.